Hello and welcome to our program. My name is Tom Rainwater and we have with us William Stewart. And again, William, it's great to have you here. It's good to be with you, Tom. And we're continuing our study in Acts together. So if you have your New Testaments and would like to follow along with our study, open your Bibles to Acts chapters 21 and 22. And we've been talking about Paul and his preaching that he's done in various parts of the world. And in chapter 21, he is headed back to Jerusalem. And on his way to Jerusalem, he's received warnings that things are not going to go well for him. That's right, Tom. And we've already seen where some wanted to not have him go, the elders at Ephesus, when they met him in Miletus. And as we continue here in chapter 21, he's going to receive more warnings that he ought not go. In the process of his journey to Jerusalem, he came to Tyre, and we read at verse 4 that finding disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, we had noticed previously in chapter 20 that he stayed seven days in Troas, and certainly the understandable reason is that he stayed so that he might spend the Lord's Day with these disciples. But here's a warning that he ought not go to Jerusalem warned through the Spirit uh, of the things that would come. Exactly, and I think the Spirit is telling him to wait a while before he goes. And, of course, he's going to spend his time there entire worshiping with the saints, as you said there. But another interesting thing about this, William, is that we have in this text the word we several times. And so, since Luke is the author of the book of Acts, Luke here is now part of Paul's journeying, and he's with Paul at this time. And if we were to look backwards at Acts chapter 20 that he was with Paul for a short period of time in verses 5 and 6 and then also in verses 13, 14 and 15 and then Luke is back with him again here in Acts chapter 21 and after Paul left Tyre after delaying there for a short time apparently he went to Caesarea where Philip the Evangelist was and William met somebody that we saw back in Acts chapter 8 That's exactly the right time. We've met this man before in Acts chapter 8, as you mentioned, Philip the Evangelist, who was speaking on that occasion. And we first met him in chapter 6. And remember, in Acts chapter 6, there were seven who were chosen to serve tables. And Philip was one of those. And so he also is, is now an evangelist. He's preaching the gospel. And we're told that they stayed a few days with Philip and with his family. And while they were there a prophet came from Judea, a prophet by the name of Agabus. And we've met Agabus before as well. Back in chapter 11, Agabus came and he brought a prophecy regarding a famine that would come upon the whole land. And that prophecy came true. And he comes this time bearing another prophecy. And this one is specifically about the Apostle Paul. He took Paul's belt and he tied himself up and he... He says, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and delivers him into the hand of the Gentiles. Again, a warning of what's going to take place when Paul goes down to Jerusalem. And the response of the brethren is that they don't want him to go. They're concerned for Paul. They're rather upset, and so they plead with him not to go. Right, and indeed, William, it's going to be a very bad situation for him in Jerusalem. But God's will is that God's going to make this into something that is good. Paul's going to have a lot of opportunity to preach to people that he wouldn't have otherwise preached to. But, again, Paul's attitude is that if it's the Lord's will, and if I can do his will there in Jerusalem, I'm going. And Paul says here in verse 13, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's not sure exactly what's going to happen, but he says, I'm willing to die for the cause of Christ. And Paul didn't put himself first like so many people do. He put the, the needs and interests of others and whoever he could influence. And Tom, you mentioned the opportunities that were going to come because of what the Lord had planned for Paul. That brought to my mind in Acts chapter 9 when... Ananias was being sent to Saul of Tarsus to teach him and at verse 15 the Lord said to Ananias go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles kings and the children of Israel well 
those kinds of opportunities are going to be open to him. He's already bore the gospel before some Gentiles and before some of the children of Israel. But as we continue on and we see what takes place after he has gone to Jerusalem, he's going to be talking with some kings. He's going to have some rather important audiences. And so it, it's part of the Lord's will. Paul understands that. And so he, he's determined to go and, and to give even his life, if necessary, to serve the Lord. Right. And those who were present, including Luke, in verse 14, saw that Paul would not be persuaded otherwise. And when they saw that, they ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And so in verse 15 and following, we have that completed journey that Paul makes to Jerusalem. He arrives there, and the brethren who are there receive him gladly. They're happy to see him. And Paul goes into James the next day, James the Apostle, and then all the elders there at the church in Jerusalem were present. And in verse 19, when he had greeted them, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So they are very happy to hear that many people are converted to Christ there throughout the Roman Empire. But those Christians there in Jerusalem are quite concerned because there have been reports, false reports about Paul that have been circulating that somehow Paul was preaching against Moses, that he was teaching the Jews to forsake their national traditions and saying that Jews ought not to circumcise their children. Paul hadn't been preaching that. Paul's message to the Gentiles is that they didn't have to be circumcised to be saved, that circumcision wasn't part of the gospel of Christ. But it wasn't wrong for a person to be circumcised as long as they didn't press it and say, well, you have to be circumcised to be saved. So Paul wasn't going against the the national custom of circumcision. He wasn't telling Jews they ought not to do that. And so the Christians have a plan for Paul in that, all right, we want you to show the people that you do not reject the national customs of this land. We want you to participate in something. That's right, Tom. And so they have a a plan which they have devised. And there are these men who have taken a vow. At verse 23, we're told about them. And so at verse 24, it says, Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles, he is told... We have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Now, verse 25, we saw that before in Acts chapter 15. And uh, recall Paul had come down and, and discussed with the elders and with the apostles. But they tell Paul, here is how we're going to take care of this misunderstanding of some that, that you've turned away from the law show them that you still keep the customs. And certainly Paul was willing to do so. Paul didn't teach against the customs of the Jews. He didn't teach against the things that were spoken of by Moses. He taught that the Gentiles ought not do those things. And so Paul willingly did so. At verse 26, he took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, he entered the temple to announce the expiration of days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. And so seven days were almost ended, and the Jews from Asia came and saw Paul there in the temple, and they laid hands. Now notice, these are the Jews from Asia. Mm -hmm. These aren't the Jews from Jerusalem. Paul is is showing them that he, he does walk orderly. He does walk according to the custom of the Jews, the custom of the law of Moses. But the Jews from Asia are going to cause problem, and we've seen that through our study. Absolutely. We saw that back in Acts chapters 13 and 14 where the Jews uh, there in Asia were pursuing Paul from city to city. They stoned him and left him for dead in Lystra. Uh, They wanted him dead and of course Paul would slip out of the grip and of course Paul by the uh, help of God was teaching those people, converting the ones to the gospel who would hear and listen and obey. And so they see him in Jerusalem. And uh, they cry out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Well, the charges they bring are untrue. Paul had not been preaching against those things, and he had not brought a Gentile into the temple grounds. 
they assumed that he did because in verse 29 it says for they had previously seen Prometheus the Ephesian with him in the city whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple well the truth didn't matter to them they found an excuse to use this charge against him because they knew it would stir up the people of the city against him and it did exactly that Indeed, Tom, it did stir up the city. Verse 30 tells us all the city was disturbed. And the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now, just having read that verse, I'm I'm wondering where Prometheus is. (laughs) He's not there. there. They've made this accusation, but where's this Greek that he brought into the temple? But they wanted to start a, a ruckus over Paul. And so... They're seeking to kill him. That's what verse 31 tells us. As they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And so they have started a riot through false accusations against Paul. And again, this is nothing new for these Jews from Asia. They've done this before. And they failed on previous occasions to cause death. They've caused harm to Paul, but they've not been able to bring forth death. But their intent is obvious. They seek to kill him. Mm-hmm. And so the, the uproar is, is such that even the commander of the Roman army who's there in Jerusalem is aware of it now. And uh, he doesn't want an uproar in the city. This is something that's going to be troublesome and that's going to, to fall upon his head. And so he needs to bring some kind of semblance of order to the things that are going on. Right. The Romans were occupiers of of much of the land at the time. They were the big world power, and they didn't want a a population rising up for any reason because that's negative for them. And as the commander comes in, they get Paul. The people are beating Paul. And the commander and those with him bound Paul with two chains. and, And, of course, the commander wants to know, well, what happened? What's going on? What did you do? And so people in the crowd are shouting one thing and another, and he couldn't tell you know, what the truth was from all of that mess. And so he commanded that Paul be taken to the barracks. It says in verse 35 about Paul that when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. And they're pressing in so close, they're trying to carry him out of there. In verse 36, the crowd is shouting out, Away with him! Do away with him! Kill him! And uh, so... Paul is going to be questioned by the commander. And in verse 37, it says that as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? And he replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago raised an insurrection and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? So the commander assumes that Paul must be some really bad guy. Perhaps it's that bad guy that done this in the past and was wanted. And Paul says simply in verse 39, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. And Tom, two things of note through this text. That prophecy of Agabus, it came true. (laughs) It happened just as Agabus had said it would. And the similarities between this case of Paul and Jesus the anger of the crowd against him for things that are, are falsely accused. And uh, at verse 36, their, their cry out of, Away with him! Does that not remind us a bit of, Crucify him! Crucify yeah. him! Very similar in what's going on. And again, Paul is not guilty of the things that he's accused of, and neither was our Lord guilty of those things that he was accused of. But when folks are upset with somebody when they're preaching or teaching the truth, they'll rile up against that person and do what they can. And that's what we see in this text. Right. And when Paul began to speak, he motions his hand to the crowd. The crowd gets quiet. And and Paul speaks to them in the Hebrew language. And, of course, as the charge was, Paul did not respect the Hebrew customs. But here he's speaking to them in the Hebrew language. And I think this is key for us to study in, in this Uh, program today what Paul says to the crowd I think is very important as he begins the speech here in chapter 22 he says men brethren and fathers hear my defense before you now and when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language they kept all the more silent and then he said 
I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, talking about Christians, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem to be punished. So, Paul gives a detailed description as to who he is and his background, and these are things that can be easily verified through the high priest and those of the council there in Jerusalem. And Tom, in the process of what he is saying, he commends their zeal. He says, I was zealous toward God as you all are today. He understands that those who are in Jerusalem, at least, the Judean Jews, are doing this out of a zeal for God, and they're believing these accusations. But their zeal is without knowledge. And he at one time was zealous, yet without knowledge. And that's why at one time he persecuted this way. He persecuted Christians. Mm -hmm. But he's going to go on now in the text, and he's going to reveal to them the time of his conversion, when he came to know exactly who this Jesus of Nazareth was. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He's explaining, William, the change that occurred in his life. Because how do you explain that, that a man who is so zealous for Judaism becomes so zealous for Christ? Now, what, what, how can that be explained? What happened to him? Well, he's telling that very instance there on the way to Damascus about when the change began to take place. He says in verse 6, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And of course, William, we saw this in Acts chapter 9. And here he is explaining to the crowd, All right, this happened to me. And so he says here in verse 8, So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And so here, at that time in his life, he could see clearly and understand that Jesus of Nazareth had been raised from the dead because here he is talking to him. And that those whom Paul was persecuting, these Christians, were absolutely right. They were truthful in saying that Jesus is risen from the dead, that he is our Savior and died on the cross for our sins. So Paul wanted to know, what do I do? And the Lord told him in verse 10, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And so then, Tom, as we continue on in the description of those things that had formerly taken place in Paul's life, he couldn't see. He was blinded by this light, and so he was led by the hand into Damascus. And then at verse 12, we're told about Ananias. Ananias, who was a, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. And he came... To Saul. Now remember earlier in the program we talked about chapter 9 and referred to Ananias and the Lord had to convince Ananias to go. Ananias knew who Saul of Tarsus was. Saul was the man who was going everywhere persecuting Christians. And yet the Lord told him that he should go and that he should speak to this man. And so Ananias came in and we're told that he stood there and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. And so then, as Ananias continues to speak with him, at verse 16, he says, Now why are you waiting? Saul, you've still not done everything that you need to do. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The inference of Ananias saying that is that in the process of his conversation with Saul, he had told him, you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Just as we have seen throughout our study in the book of Acts, that that is the pattern of salvation. That is the consistent message that was spoken in every occasion when those who are, are dead in sin meet someone who is speaking the gospel of Christ. Exactly, William. And one important point from this is when Ananias tells him here, 
Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. That means that Paul's sins were still there until he did those things. That faith alone does not take care of your sin. Paul came to faith on the road to Damascus. He understood that he was speaking to Jesus and he believed, but yet he wasn't saved from his sins yet. He needed to arise and be baptized to have his sins washed away. And, and that's so important. We just can't stop with faith. We have to do what God says. And Tom, it's not uncommon to hear religious folks today say that, yes, we need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And different folks mean different things when they say that. Some, by that, they just simply mean you need to to call out to Jesus or you need to say a sinner's prayer. Well, we find out right here in this text what it means to call on the name of the Lord. It means to be obedient to the, to the message that the Lord has given. How was Saul of Tarsus going to call on the name of the Lord? By arising and being baptized according to the commandment of God. And thus his sins would be washed away and thus he would have called out to the Lord uh, through his obedience to the Lord's will. Right. Calling on the name of the Lord simply means we are submitting ourselves to the Lord's authority and doing what he says. And indeed, when we obey His will, when we are baptized, when we are immersed in water, He in heaven takes away our sin. That's the way He designed His plan of salvation. And who are we to argue with it? (laughs) He's the Lord. We need to do the submitting. And so, Tom, as we move on in the text at verse 17, Paul says, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem when I was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and I saw him saying to me make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me and so he speaks of an occasion following this conversion he doesn't tell us exactly how long afterward but the Lord tells him you need to leave this city and as we already had seen back in Acts chapter 9 his mission was going to be to the Gentiles not to the Jews primarily And so the Lord tells them, you need to leave. They'll not receive your testimony concerning me. Well, that's going to happen here in this text too, (laughs) that they're not going to receive his testimony concerning the Lord. And so at verse 19, he says, So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And it's as though he's saying, well, Lord, look at the change in my life. Surely that's going to affect them. They know what I used to do, and if I'm preaching for you now, what a change. But the Lord says, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And certainly we might understand the reasoning of the Apostle Paul or what he's thinking that you know such a change has got to affect them as well. But the Lord has a mission for him. And so Paul is going to submit to the Lord's mission and go to the Gentiles and and preach the gospel among those who had not heard about Jesus of Nazareth previously. Right. And you have to consider, now, Paul is saying all of this. He's explaining all of this to this Jewish crowd here who had tried to kill him. And they've been listening to him until he says the word Gentiles. (laughs) They hate Gentiles. And they didn't like the fact that Paul was preaching to them And it says in verse 22, they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. So they didn't want to listen anymore. It says, Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, acting like a very angry, spoiled group of people, (laughs) the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. So <laughs> the commander is assuming that Paul, he must, he must be a bad guy if they hate him so much. So they are going to scourge him to try and get the, what he thinks is the truth out of him. And then as they were bounding Paul with, with thongs, he said to the centurion, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? And that got the attention of the centurion because Paul was a Roman citizen. It was illegal under Roman law 
to beat a man, to punish a man who is a Roman citizen before a trial, before he has a chance to defend himself. And the centurion tells the commander, take care of what you do, for this man's a Roman. We better be careful here. Because if you were a Roman soldier or centurion and you violated someone's civil rights as a Roman, you would be punished. So the commander came and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. And the commander said, with a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And uh, apparently the Roman law allowed you that if you weren't born a Roman citizen, you could pay a lot of money and become a citizen. And Paul says, but I was born a citizen. And in the Roman Empire, that was considered a greater and higher thing to be born a Roman citizen. Remember, he was born in Tarsus, which was a Roman city. So in verse 29, then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman because he had bound him. So he was scared for just even binding him for that. And so here we have Paul in the hands of the Romans. All right, he's being protected from the Jews by the Romans, but the Romans here don't know what to do with him. That's exactly right, Tom. The they're not sure what to do at this point and as we continue in our study in the next several programs we're going to see what the Romans do with Paul and how they try to resolve the problems between Paul and the Jews and in the process Paul is going to have the opportunity to teach the gospel in this text here he made his defense and his defense was the gospel and consistently what we're going to see when Paul has opportunity to speak he's going to speak about Jesus of Nazareth He's going to speak about the Lord who saved him and who's given the gospel message that all might be saved. Exactly. And this time, his audience will be his captors. It will be the Romans and the Roman leaders who are going to be involved in Paul's case. But again, back to something that we said earlier in the program, when Paul says to the crowd how he was saved from his sins, we can be saved from our sins today in the same way. That's exactly right. He heard the gospel message. He came to an understanding of who Jesus of Nazareth was. And thus he submitted to the commandments of God. He repented of sin. He was obedient to the command to be baptized for the remission of sin. And at that point, he became a child of God. At that point, he was saved from sin and had the hope of heaven. And friends, we need to do the same. As we've seen throughout the book of Acts, that plan of salvation that God has put in place through the gospel message has not changed. It is the same for every individual. And so, friend, have you obeyed the gospel message? We'd love to help you in studying. We'd love to help you in your obedience to God's will that you might have the hope of heaven. If we can do so, won't you give us a call? The number will be given here at the end of the program. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for listening and have a great day.